Welcome to our Apologetics Bible Study series on the Book of Hebrews. I'm really excited to dig in and work our way through this remarkable text, and our focus is going to be a little bit different than you might be used to. For those of you new to us, this ministry is all about defending the biblical roots of Christianity from false teachings like Torahism, which you might know as Hebrew roots or Torah-observant Christianity. But this particular Bible study isn't just relevant to our discussions with so-called Torah keepers. I think it's going to be helpful for any of us, myself included, who can tend to drift towards legalism or, or even just the mistaken idea, consciously or subconsciously, that our works contribute in some small way to our righteousness in God's eyes. That there are some things we need to do in order to be fully right with God. But that human model of performing to earn rewards isn't how righteousness or salvation work in God's economy. It's based on faith, which is what the 11th and 12th chapters of Hebrews is all about. It's not about our performance or how good we are. It's about God and how great He is and what He did for us. And Hebrews is going to be a profitable book to study because it offers so much insight into the historical and biblical roots of our faith. In fact, to really understand some of the imagery and the profound statements that the author makes about Jesus, we're going to be taking a close look at the system of worship prescribed in the Torah that foreshadowed and was ultimately fulfilled in Christ, such as the temple, the Levitical priesthood, the sacrifices, the covenant, and so on. If you've ever wondered what those things were all about and why they were given, Hebrews is the book for you. And the more we learn, the more amazing it is. So we're going to be jumping back and forth between the Old and New Testaments a lot as we work our way through Hebrews and, and explore the roots and the, the richness of the Christian faith and the amazing way that God chose to do things. In fact, of all the New Testament books, Hebrews provides us with the most explicit and direct connection between the two Testaments, the two covenants. And it highlights both the continuity and the evolution of God's grand story. And because this is an apologetics Bible study, we're going to approach the book of Hebrews with an eye for the theological themes that speak to the relationship between the Christian and the Torah. D do some of the Old Testament laws still apply to Christians today? Which laws have been fulfilled by Jesus? How does fulfillment even work? These are all questions that the author of Hebrews speaks to. Now, if I could sum up the entire book of Hebrews in one word, it would be better. The word better is used 13 times in this text to show the superiority of Jesus over everything else. We're going to see that Jesus is better than the angels. He brought a better hope. He's the mediator of a superior covenant that was established on better promises. His is a better ministry than Moses and the Levites because he offered a superior sacrifice and is now our greater high priest. So here in part one, we're going to first establish the historical and literary setting of Hebrews, and then we'll jump into the text of chapter one and look at the, the prologue, the first four verses. And I would encourage you to be reading through the book of Hebrews for yourself as we go. And by the way, if you like videos like this, would you consider supporting our ministry? There are a bunch of ways to do that. You could subscribe to our channel, uh, comment on our videos, share them on your socials, and you can also donate if you feel so moved by clicking on the thanks button below or the donate link in the video description. Thank you so much. Like any book of the Bible, it's important to begin our study by examining the historical and literary context of what we're about to read. The more we know about who wrote the book and, and who it was written to and why it was written and when it was written and so on, the more context we have for understanding the text as we go through it and the more we'll learn about God's Word. And Hebrews is a remarkable book. It contains some of the best known passages in the Bible and, and many scholars consider it to be the purest and best Greek writing in the entire New Testament. It's very literary. It's an elevated level of Greek as compared to other New Testament writings. So in English, it would be like the difference between reading Shakespeare and Mark Twain. Now, as far as the author, the early church father Origen probably put it best when he said, who wrote the epistle? God only knows. 
The text itself doesn't say who wrote it, and in the, early re in the early years, no one was identified as its author. But gradually, tradition adopted the idea that it was written by the Apostle Paul, which persists to some degree today. But that's been almost universally ruled out by biblical scholars based on a wide range of literary differences between Hebrews and the writings of Paul. For example, in every one of Paul's epistles, he explicitly identifies himself as the author but the author of Hebrews doesn't tell us his name. Also, the Greek in this book is superior to what we see from Paul in a technical sense, in terms of vocabulary and sentence structure. And on top of that, the literary patterns and characteristics that we find throughout Paul's writings, his unique voice as expressed in his choice of words and imagery and so on, just aren't found in Hebrews. So along the way, some have suggested that it, it could have been written by Aquila and Priscilla, or Luke, who was also an excellent Greek writer, or James, or Clement of Rome. But there are actually problems with each of those potential authors. Martin Luther proposed that it was written by Apollos, which I personally think is probably the best candidate since he knew Paul and was from Alexandria, and, and we have no evidence that would exclude him. But really, it's all just speculation. While we may not know the identity of the, author, of the author, we learn a lot about him from the text of this epistle. One commentator, uh, Donald Guthrie, writes this, He is a man who has pondered long on the Christian approach to the Old Testament. What he writes has been well thought out. He knows where his line of argument is going. In spite of his anonymity, he is a force to be reckoned with in early Christian theology. He gives us the clearest discussion of the Christian approach to the Old Testament of any of the New Testament writers. And based on his masterful interpretation of the Jewish scriptures and, and, and traditions and his deep knowledge of the Hebrew religious system, the author was most likely a highly educated Jewish man. And the text also reveals that the audience and the author knew one another and that both were familiar with some common people, such as Timothy. Now, our primary source for the date of the writing comes from the letter itself. In chapter 2, verse 3, the author writes that salvation was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. So both the writer and his audience are second-generation Christians. These were people who heard the gospel from other believers rather than from Jesus himself. And the text also reveals that his audience had been believers for some amount of time and had achieved some level of maturity in terms of their theology and practice, which likely would have taken a decade or two to, to emerge. The author also indicates that Timothy was still alive at the time of this writing. And if we align that with the chronology of Paul's life, we arrive at the late 50s or even 60 AD as probably the earliest this letter could have been written. Another big clue about the date is based on what the text doesn't say. Because, number one, we know from the text that the author wasn't writing in isolation from the rest of the world. And number two, it's a pretty safe assumption that news of the destruction of Jerusalem and the, and the Jewish temple, which happened in 70 AD, would have traveled quickly throughout the Roman Empire, especially among the Jewish people scattered throughout the Mediterranean region. Therefore, it's pretty hard to believe that the author wouldn't have mentioned the destruction of the temple in this letter if he'd heard about it, especially considering that he specifically discusses the temple and the priesthood at length. And if those things had already come to an end, it's hard to imagine he wouldn't, he wouldn't have mentioned them. It's also hard to imagine that he would have described the Mosaic Covenant like he did in chapter 8, verse 13, where he says it's becoming obsolete and growing old and ready to vanish away. We would expect those sentiments to be expressed in the past tense if the temple and the priesthood had already come to an end. So for these and other reasons, most scholars place the date for this writing as sometime prior to the destruction of temple in 70 AD. And I'm in that camp as well. So I think the best range for dating Hebrews is sometime between 60 and 70. This would have been 30 plus years after the resurrection and just a few years before the destruction of the temple. And as we'll see, understanding that when the author wrote this text, the temple and the priesthood were still standing and the sacrifices were still ongoing, really helps make sense of some of the author's statements. 
Interestingly, there is some debate as, as to whether Hebrews was a letter or epistle, like we see from Paul and Peter and James and others, or if this was originally intended as a sermon. The author really only makes one specific statement about his purpose for writing. In chapter 13, verse 22, he says, Bear with my word of exhortation. And the phrase, word of exhortation, comes from the Greek, logon tes periklesus, which is the same basic phrase used in Acts 13, 15, where it specifically refers to a spoken word of encouragement. Now, if that's the case in Hebrews, it would suggest that this text was originally written as a sermon and later turned into a letter. In fact, if you read the whole book of Hebrews aloud, it takes about 35 minutes and it really does lend itself well to the, to the spoken word. Of course, that brings up the issue that if Hebrews was not originally a letter, we have to then assume that the author later added a closing greeting to a sermon, because this book ends very much like a letter. On the other hand, if Hebrews was always intended as a letter, we have to wonder if there was an opening salutation that was somehow lost without a trace. In the end, I tend to, to agree with Paul Ellingworth, who says this, it therefore seems best to conclude, while fully recognizing the oral features which have led a majority of scholars to describe the body of Hebrews as a sermon, that Hebrews in its present form may be considered as a letter or epistle, in which its author displays skill in both written and indirectly oral communication. So who is he writing to and why was this letter written? Well, these are obviously important details to understand because the more we know about the purpose and the occasion of the writing, the more context we have for what the author says. And when we examine the text of this book, it, a compelling picture of the author's intended audience begins to emerge, and we learn at least four things about them. First of all, they were people who had come to faith in Jesus. They were believers. A number of passages are based on that tacit assumption. In fact, as we'll see, one of the central purposes of this letter is to stir up the faith of the reader, which was waning. Four times in the letter, the author urges his readers to hold fast to their confession of faith and their hope in Jesus. Secondly, the text makes no mention of pagan religion or rites, and the author never tries to, to bridge that cultural gap between his Judeo-Christian statements and his readers, right? He fully expects that they're familiar with all of the people and institutions and, and texts and laws and, and, and even the divine authority of the Old Testament. In other words, this epistle includes a lot of insider baseball speak, that would have only made sense to people who were steeped in Jewish ways and theology. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone he was addressing was Jewish, but if there were Gentiles in his readership, they were presumed to have a working knowledge of Second Temple Judaism. Third, there might be a clue to the, to the location of their recipients in the second to last line of the book, but it's, it's tentative. So Hebrews 13, 24 says, those who come from Italy send you greetings. Now, some suggest that the reason that the author mentioned that there were people from Italy with him was because he was writing to an audience in Italy who knew them. But where in Italy, we have no idea, although we know that the most prominent church was in Rome, of course. But, but again, this is just guesswork. Now, fourth, we know something was causing his readers to question their faith in Jesus and consider either returning to or just outwardly incorporating the religious rituals of Judaism. William Lane writes, The writer is alarmed at the group's attraction to traditions that he regarded as inconsistent with the word of God proclaimed by their former leaders. One factor behind this attraction to, to Jewish traditions could have been the delay of Christ's return, which many first century Christians felt was imminent. His early followers waited a year, two years, and then five years, 10 years, 20, 30, and there was still no sign that Jesus was coming back. And all the while, Jewish believers in Jesus, like, like those to whom this letter was written, were experiencing ever-increasing friction and even persecution on two fronts. First, from the Jewish community, as, as Jesus had warned, because they confessed faith in him, 
they were being persecuted and, and put out of the synagogues by their fellow Jews. And second, they were being persecuted by the Romans. Remember, Judaism was allowed in the pagan Roman Empire, whereas Christianity at that time was deemed religio illicita, an illegal religion. So a lot of their problems would have been solved if they had left Jesus behind, or at least worshipped him in secret, and outwardly returned to Judaism with the temple and the priesthood and everything. And that's why we see this extended discussion in Hebrews about the superiority of Jesus and the new covenant in all those areas. I mean, think about what a dramatic change this would have been for Jewish followers of Jesus. First century Christianity offered nothing that compared with the grandness and the majesty and antiquity of the temple and the priesthood, right? To use a modern term, they were used to high church with robes and, and rituals and mikvah and incense and all taking place in the illustrious and sacred temple of Yahweh. Meanwhile, early Christians were meeting in each other's homes where they served one another. There was no altar, no priesthood, no hierarchy. There were no sacrifices. And, and while the novelty of this difference might have been appealing at first, it's not surprising that the continual hardship that Jewish believers in Jesus faced caused some to question their decision to follow him. I believe this is why more broadly in the New Testament, we find Jewish believers who were exploring the idea of maybe holding on to both systems, especially since Jews and Christians both worship the same God of Israel and use the same scriptures. This is what the Judaizers were doing that we read about in, in Acts 15 and Galatians and elsewhere. And it's exactly what the author of Hebrews is addressing in his letter. In fact, he actually lays out theological reasons for the lack of those high church rituals, as glorious as they may have seemed. As we'll see, he explains that the old order was given to point us to Jesus, where it found its complete fulfillment. In fact, the very absence of those old rituals was, in a sense, the highest glory of faith in Jesus, the promised Messiah, because it proclaims his superiority over the old order. As Jesus taught, no one uses a piece of new cloth to patch up an old garment, and new wine isn't stored in old wineskin. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So the author of Hebrews is, number one, encouraging his readers who are losing hope to hold fast to their faith in Jesus because he knows that they're undergoing persecution and paying a steep price for it. And number two, he's building an impressively strong case for the superiority of Jesus and the new covenant over Moses and the old covenant. And number three, he's also warning them against the danger of the apostasy of leaving Jesus to return to Judaism. He says in chapter three that to do so would be to fall away from the living God. And in chapter six, he says that those who do so are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. And in Hebrews chapter 10, he says that they have trampled underfoot the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraged the Spirit of grace. <sighs> He's not playing around. And let that be a word of warning to our, our modern Torah observant friends who want to start heading down that path and adopting the old order of Judaism. There's one other topic that's important for us to understand before we dive into the text, because we're going to run into it a lot. As I mentioned earlier, the author makes great use of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, right? He knows it well, and there are many quotes and allusions to it. And one thing that's really interesting to notice is that when the writer quotes from the Old Testament, he most often uses the Septuagint, the Greek translation, rather than the original Hebrew text. And where that can become an issue, and we'll run into this several times throughout this series, is when the author is basing his theological point on something the Septuagint says that differs from the traditional Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible. There are cases where the author will quote something from the Old Testament to make a point. We might, we might wonder what in the world he's thinking because it doesn't seem like the Old Testament author was trying to say what the, Hebrews of, uh, what the author of Hebrews is telling us. 
And this gets us into the idea of something called census plenier, which means the fuller sense. This is a term that scholars use in the context of interpreting the Bible, and it sometimes leads to confusion. Donald Hagner, in his book on Hebrews, writes this, Given the fulfillment that has come to God's people in Jesus Christ, the Old Testament is seen to possess a fuller or deeper sense, a census plenier. The recognition of this fuller meaning of the Old Testament that goes beyond the intention of the original authors does not open the door to arbitrary and frivolous exegesis, or eisegesis, as is sometimes alleged. Sometimes alleged. One is able to compare the Old and New Testaments and repeatedly say, this is that. This type of interpretation is called Pesher. Now, Pesher is a very Jewish style of interpretation, so it makes sense that the author of Hebrews would use such a technique, and his Jewish readers would have no problem at all with what he did. And, and for believers today who, who accept the New Testament as the inspired Word of God, we know that whatever license the author took in his interpretation of the Hebrew Scriptures, he did so under the supervision of the Holy Spirit. But Hagner's point is that teachers and scribes in the Second Temple period at the time of Christ took a wider view of the text that often went beyond the specific words on paper, right? They read those words in light of the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures, bringing in other connected ideas and, and building on other passages and concepts. And these connections aren't immediately obvious to us, to, to us as modern readers. As a sort of analogy, think about a Star Wars enthusiast, right? When they read the words, may the force be with you, they instantly attach all kinds of additional context, right? They think of characters like Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi and, and the Rebel Alliance and the Empire and spaceships and lightsabers and so on, right? So the meaning they read into that phrase goes beyond the literal understanding of the text itself. And if you're not familiar with Star Wars, then none of that additional context is available to you. And the same is true in the book of Hebrews. If we're not familiar with the depth and the breadth of the Hebrew Scriptures and first century theological ideas, we're going to miss the context that the author had available to him when making his theological points. So what he's doing is still biblical. He's taking a wider view of Scripture and using related passages and ideas and imagery to arrive at his theological conclusions. And by studying the way that the author did this as we work our way through this Bible study, it's going to really help us gain that wider context for ourselves. And here's a really important distinction. The author's use of census plenier, the fuller sense of those Old Testament passages, is occurring from the perspective of the other side of the cross. The Tanakh very much looks forward to the coming of the promised Messiah figure, right, who would arrive at some point in the distant future. Now, the Old Testament authors didn't know who it would be or, or when he would come. But the author of Hebrews, on the other hand, is writing after the life and death and resurrection of the Messiah. By the time of the book of Hebrews was written, God had revealed both who the Messiah would be, it was Yeshua Hanatsri, Jesus the Nazarene, and when the, when the Messiah would come, which from the perspective of the author of Hebrews was 30 years or so before he wrote this letter, which today we recognize as the final years of the Second Temple period. So Donald Hagner continues, The first Christians, all of them Jew, Jews, read their Old Testament scriptures differently after they had encountered the risen Christ and the fulfillment he brought. From that time on, Christ was the hermeneutical key that unlocked the meaning of the Old Testament. Their interpretation became Christocentric. In other words, the original Old Testament authors, unconsciously, yet guided by the Holy Spirit, alluded to things beyond the, the horizon of their knowledge. So some of the things they wrote, or at least the deeper meaning behind their words, wouldn't be fully revealed until Christ came. And this is a really amazing aspect of letting Scripture interpret itself. The, the New Testament authors were writing in the first days of the Christian faith, 2,000 years closer to the events than we are today. They, they spoke the language and understood and interpreted the original Hebrew Scriptures in their first century context. And they did so through the new prism 
of the revelation of Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. We can almost think of the New Testament as an inspired commentary on the Old Testament. Here's how Ellingworth puts it. The author of Hebrews does not attempt, like a modern historian, to return behind secondary traditions to the original or earliest recoverable sources. The author inherits an interpreted Bible and makes his own, often original, contribution to the interpretive tradition in which he stands. He therefore shows special interest precisely not in the primary historical accounts, but in those texts which already embody a considerable element of interpretation, such as the hymn of Moses and the Psalms. The reason for this is that, like other New Testament writers, he's interested in Old Testament events and texts as a means of articulating Christian truth, and more specifically, as a means of strengthening his reader's faith. Good stuff. Okay, so I think we're ready. The table is set. I've rambled on long enough. Let's jump into the text of Hebrews. So rather than a typical opening salutation like we find in the other New Testament epistles, the author opens with a soaring cosmic statement that centers his readers on the theological and historical timeline of the God of Israel. So let's read the first four verses, which are the prologue of the letter. And I'll be using the ESV translation for this Bible study. So Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the, the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Wow, that is grand language. And in this prologue, really, really sets the stage for this entire book in at least three important ways. First, the author begins by grounding his statements about Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures and the history of the God of Israel. He's not telling a brand new story unconnected to the past. No, Jesus is the next and most important chapter in God's grand story of, of redemption. So there's a strong emphasis on the Hebrew scriptures, especially the Torah, as we'll see in the coming chapters. This is why it's so important for us Christians to study and spend time in the Old Testament. It's where it all began. And it's the only way we can fully understand who Jesus is and what he did for us. R remember, during his earthly ministry, Jesus talked about how the Hebrew scriptures all pointed to him. And the author of Hebrews is going to unpack that in detail. And notice that he writes in verse 1, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets which is our first indication that the author is most likely Jewish and writing primarily to Jewish believers in Jesus. So, the author is grounding his readers in the familiar and traditional setting of the Torah and then expertly guiding them into God's new revelation. And he'll use the same pattern several times in this book of leading his readers from facts they already know into new information. And at the same time, He's also underscoring God's unchanging nature and faithfulness, even as his story evolves from long ago into these last days. God does not change in his holiness and moral perfection and his very nature, but the way he relates to his people does, especially in light of the work of Christ. Which brings us to the second way that this prologue sets the stage for the book of Hebrews. The author opens by establishing a very high Christology, which he'll carry throughout this entire epistle. Right off the bat, he's teaching the divinity of Jesus. He tells us that Jesus is heir of all things, and that God created the world through Jesus, and he describes him as the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature, and he says he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Wow. If anyone tries to tell you that Jesus was merely a man and not divine, just have them read the first three verses of Hebrews. 
And don't miss the fact that these are the words of a Jewish man for whom the worship of a human being would have been idolatry. And here he is, just years after Christ's resurrection, long before legend would have had a chance to develop, and he's praising this man who had recently walked among them as divine, as God incarnate. The deity of Jesus isn't an idea that developed over time. It's the way Christianity began right out of the gate. It's what Jesus himself declared, and then God validated him by raising him from the dead. And the world has never been the same ever since. And this high view of Christ explains the author's use of census plenier, which we just talked about. He, talk, he, he interprets the Old Testament in that fuller sense because Jesus is divine. And he was alive and active in creation and all throughout Israel's history. And when we read the Old Testament with that knowledge, everything takes on this fuller meaning. Therefore, as Ellingworth says, any part of the Old Testament may thus, in principle, be understood as speaking about Christ or as spoken to or by him. Indeed, since Christ was already at work in Old Testament times, even an Old Testament text without a future reference, such as Psalm 40, which is referenced in Hebrews 10, may be applied to Christ. And we're going to see a whole lot of that in this book. And this high Christology brings us to the third way that this prologue sets the stage for the rest of the book. And that is the superiority of Jesus over the old way. And don't misunderstand. The old way was not bad or wrong or insufficient. It was established by God himself. And as we read in Galatians 3 and elsewhere, it was always intended to be temporary, to point us to Christ. And so at the arrival of Jesus, the old way had successfully served its God-ordained purpose. And now, the author of Hebrews tells us, Christ has arrived with his superior ministry and better covenant based on better promises. This is a recurring theme that we're going to come across time and again. And again, it's because the author is encouraging his readers to hold fast to their faith in Jesus and not return to the old ways, the old system, because Jesus is superior to all of that. But here in the prologue, he specifically says that Jesus is superior to the angels and has a more excellent name. Now, we tend to think of angels as superior to humans because they're these heavenly beings who dwell in the presence of the living God, serving and, and worshiping him continually, right? But the author says that Jesus is superior to the angels because he's not a part of God's creation. He's a part of God himself. He's the Son of God who sits at Yahweh's right hand in glory. And the author is going to continue on in the next few verses of chapter 1 to explain the ways in which Jesus is superior to the angels. So we can kind of think of this prologue as the opening movement of a symphony, right? Hebrews isn't a modern scholarly dissertation that clinically proceeds from point to point. It's more like a piece of music with recurring melodic themes that intertwine and evolve along the way. And in the prologue, we see three of those themes established. And we also learn some very important theological truths. For example, we learn that the last days have begun. You and I today are in the last days. And we learn that through Jesus, God has fully revealed his nature and his telos, his purpose. And it's a purpose that goes all the way back beyond the prophets to creation itself. God has reconciled us to himself through his son who, verse 4, made purification for our sins. And as we'll read about in chapter 10, he did so once for all. And now Jesus has been exalted to God's right hand and has been given the utmost name, higher than that of angels. And, and what does that language make you think of? Philippians 2. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Acts 4 tells us, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now that is the grand manner in which the author of Hebrews begins his text. 
and it sets the tone for the next 13 chapters that we're going to work our way through in this Bible study. Okay, we've done the important work of establishing the setting and the framework for the book of Hebrews. And that's going to pay dividends for us as we work our way through the rest of the book in our upcoming episodes. So thank you so much for watching. I hope something here has been helpful for you. We'll pick it up again in part two. Shalom.